Okay, everybody set? Yeah? We're going to, guys, we're, there's a lot of information to cover tonight in this. I mean, it's, it's quite a bit of stuff. Does anybody need no paper? before we get started? Yes. Okay. Um, can you grab clipboards and scrap paper and pens? Okay. Yeah, there, there's... Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you guys up front, I mean, you, you can take notes on some of this stuff too, but anybody that's, that actually is here tonight, if you email me, I'll send you the, the, all the PowerPoints as a slide, you know, layout. So, so that way you don't have to worry about it. You can have all the information for review. But we're going to be rolling through a lot of this stuff very, very quickly. Um, um, just because there's a lot of content to get through. Okay? Um, we're not going to have video. No. No. But I am recording it, and I'm saying this lightly because we're not going to have a lot of workshops this year, but, um, you know, something that I've found is, is kind of if you record them, it makes it that less important to actually be here. You know what I mean? But honestly, you're, you know, you, you can't get the visuals and everything, you know, by a audio recording. So, I mean, you guys will get the audio. You'll also get the PowerPoint, you know, for, for being here tonight. So, uh, you know, plain and simple, why are we talking about heart disease? Because the stats are horrendous. I mean, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing, I just printed off a, uh, a article from John Barron's website that they came out with a new report that's showing what the projections are going to be for the year 2030. And based on the current projections, by 2030, it's going to cost the United States over $1 trillion dollars. For heart disease alone, okay? That's between actual cost of care and your loss of uh, loss of productivity because you're not able to work, right? You know, so this is a huge, massive issue that if we don't start tackling now in 2011, at 2030, we are going to see that happen. You know, and of course, when that's happening on a nationwide basis, what do you, how do you think that's going to impact your bottom line? In every way. Yeah, because... It is taxed. It is going to be in, you know, nationalized healthcare or anything else. The bottom line is when everybody else is broke around you, it's kind of hard to make a good living, hence what we see right now in the economy, right? You know, so this impacts everybody. Okay, so heart disease is the silent killer. Seven steps of preventing and reversing heart disease. We're going to go through all those tonight. Here's the, here's the, the, the bottom line. The statistics, one out of every two people die from heart disease. Okay, as of right now, one out of two people. 25% of children, five and up, already have plaquing in the arteries. When they're, when they're doing autopsies on these kids that have died in motor vehicle accidents and stuff like that, they're already seeing plaquing in the arteries. 60% of 15- to 19-year-olds had plaque building up in their coronary artery, which supplies the heart. You know, and that just irritates me when you watch TV and you see that all of the commercials for food is all targeted at these kids. And this is what it's leading up to. 79, that's not thousands, 79 million Americans have heart disease right now. 871,000 deaths per year from heart disease alone compared to cancer, only 550,000 deaths. Okay? So, you know, this is literally affecting somebody. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> a question? <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to ask me if I wanted coffee. Of course. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Um, did you get the creamer, by the way? Didn't get the creamer. There's creamer if anybody wants creamer. And it's coconut creamer. Yeah, there's no sugar here. <laughs> I should have known. Yeah, that way, but there is creamer. If she needs to pass it around, she can pass it around. Okay, so... Prevention. In order to prevent heart disease or reverse heart disease, we have to know what it is, right? You know, so a lot of people think of heart disease as, you know, as one thing or another. But, but here's the term heart disease often used interchangeably with cardiovascular disease, a term that generally refers to conditions that involve narrowed or blocked blood vessels that can lead to a heart attack, chest pain, or stroke. Other heart conditions, conditions such as infections and conditions that affect your heart's muscle, valves, or beating rhythm also are considered forms of heart disease. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Think about how that, how that applies to the whole nervous system and everything else. So this is the Mayo Clinic's definition of heart disease. So you see this is a wide range of things. You know, if you happen to be a, you know, you, you guys might have seen like the soccer player or the basketball player who is out on the court. You know, there are these healthy people and all of a sudden they collapse over and die because their heart just stopped right there. Obviously that's not because of plaquing in their arteries. You know, yet that's still classified as heart disease, unfortunately, instead of subluxation, which actually it was. Oh, it's usually because they have, a, you know, they have a, a nerve being pinched off, and it shuts off that nerve, and boom, heart stops right there. 
You know, so but we get categorized as heart disease. That's a big thing there. Okay, uh, you've got a rare condition called good health. Frankly, we're not sure how to treat it. Right? <laughs> no, we don't see that very often anymore. Anybody ever been to a doctor and you say, "I'm not taking any medications," and they're like, "What? Yeah. How is that possible?" Yeah, it's just not something that they see anymore. So Mythbusters, heart disease and cancer are normal with aging, right? Everybody thinks that they're normal with aging. It's just something that happens as you get older. But the truth is heart disease and cancer are common in the Canada and U.S., but they're not normal, okay? It's not normal to have your heart shut down at 50, 60 years old. Your body is not built to do that. Because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal, Everybody's seen the difference there. Okay. All right. So uh, myth buster number two: heart disease is in my family history. So why bother, right? I can eat whatever I want to. You know, we we look at uh, uh, a good example of this. Everybody knows Jack Lane just died, 96 years old. Did you guys know that he had a uh, he had a brother that lived in 97 that ate terribly and never exercised a day in his life. You know, so that's like a big thing that people are throwing out there. Well, look at that. You know, he didn't do anything, and he lived in 97. You know, but what do you think? The quality of their life was different. A little bit different, right? And guess what? Jack died with a lot more money. <laughs> so he didn't, no. But his family is sure happy that he took care of himself. Uh, so truth, in studies, so what did he die of? What did he die of? Uh, pneumonia. Yeah. He got the same flu junk that everybody else is getting right now, but, you know, it, it turned into pneumonia, and he, and that shows on some. So the truth, in studies, Okinawans, which are from Okinawa, if anybody didn't know that, have the same high risk and low risk genes as Americans, right? So the genetics are the same. But why is it that these Okinawans live so long? We look at the difference between North America and Okinawa. Canada and U.S., four times the number of deaths from lymphoma. Uh, Western cultures, five times the number of deaths from heart disease. Six times the number of deaths from breast cancer. Older Okinawans, 1% die from heart disease and cancer. That's it. Okay? The Okinawans, just so you guys know, they have the highest percentage of people living to 100 of anybody else in the world. Okay? They have a tremendous amount of people that live called centenarians if you live to 100. The Western culture, 84% die from either heart disease or cancer. Yes? So when it says older Okinawans, how many... Okay, now it's total value. Um, 1%, whatever that is. Why does it just say older? Older Okinawans, I don't know. That's a great question. Probably they're just looking at old, you know, how many people actually die from, you know, generally speaking. Oh, so they're looking at how many people die of old age with that. Right, like generally speaking, you know, Americans, mo- as, as we age, the American, you know, you see a heart disease and cancer happening a lot more frequently in older populations. So I guess what they're trying to say is that 1% of all Okinawans who die, die from heart disease and cancer. That's what I would gather, but my good defense on that is I didn't write the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but I can find out for you, absolutely. I'm just curious, they're taking, they're putting that word there because of the statistic of what is the real statistic. Yeah, I can find out. Yep. Um, so write that down for me and email me. Because otherwise, I totally will forget. <laughs> okay, so is it genetic? Some centenarians did not possess low-risk genes. Okay, so, so the, you know, the, it's, they didn't possess it, yet they're living to 100. Okay, in fact, some had high-risk genes. Therefore, Okinawans remain slim, healthy, and robust for a full 100 years, despite bad genes or the absence of the good ones. So what does that tell you? Uh, Time Magazine, I think uh, just I think it's in the new Time Magazine, the new one that just came out. It's a whole thing about epigenetics. Has anybody seen that? Mm-hmm. I just saw it in email, I think today. And uh, so, you know, epigenetics is this whole field showing that it really doesn't matter what your genes are. It's how your lifestyle impact and turns on and turns off your genes. Okay, that's what the real name of the game is. So check that out. I think, I think it's this, this uh, issue of Time Magazine. So what's the cause? The most common cause of heart disease is, remove, or is narrowing or blockage in the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart. And we're going to show you actually what that is in a, in a video. But if it were cholesterol, why only here? And, and here's what this is saying. You know, we, we've all heard doctors say that cholesterol is what causes heart disease, right? You know, and, and that's the big problem is the plaque in the arteries. But see, your coronary arteries are the ones that actually feed blood to your heart. 
Well, if, you're, if your cholesterol is circulating through your blood, right, then it's everywhere, right? Because you don't have a different blood supply going to your coronary arteries that you do anywhere else. Okay, but why is it that in almost every case it's only the coronary arteries that plaque up and cause and cause heart attacks and strokes? Yet you don't see the same plaque build up everywhere else. You know, it's not like your walls everywhere in your body are are, are clamped shut. It's strokes in your head, so you do have it showing up other places. Mm-hmm. You you yeah yeah. You you see it, but it's not in the same frequency. You know that that's kind of the point. You see it, but it's, it doesn't. Almost every single heart attack is caused by coronary artery blockage. You know, so it's just there's something to that. You know, in in the difference in the cholesterol there that it's just it doesn't match up. It's probably some kind of irritation or something, or inflammation or something causing it. You got it. We're actually going. Yeah, we're gonna, we're going to go through that. Right, right now is planting the questions in your mind. <laughs> what's what, what's causing these things? So when you're looking at the heart, you know you've got the you've got the right atrium and ventricle that feed blood up. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to play the video, let that show you, because it explains all this stuff. Your organ about the size of your fist and is located slightly left of center in your chest. Your heart is divided into the right and left side. The division protects oxygen-rich blood from mixing with oxygen-poor blood. Together, your heart and blood vessels comprise your cardiovascular system, which circulates blood and oxygen around your body. In fact, your heart pumps about five quarts of blood every minute, and it beats about 100,000 times in one day. That's about 35 million times in a year. Oxygen-poor blood, blue blood, returns to the heart after circulating through your body. The right side of the heart, composed of the right atrium and ventricle, collects and pumps the blood to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. The lungs refresh the blood with a new supply of oxygen, making it turn red. Oxygen-rich blood, red blood, then enters the left side of the heart, composed of the left atrium and ventricle, and is pumped through the aorta to the body, to supply tissues with oxygen. Four valves within your heart keep your blood moving the right way. The tricuspid, mitral, pulmonary, and aortic valves work like gates on a fence. They open only one way and only when pushed on. Each valve opens and closes once per heartbeat, or about once every second. A beating heart contracts and relaxes. Contraction is called systole, and relaxing is called diastole. During systole, your ventricles contract, forcing blood into the going to your lungs and body, much like ketchup being forced out of a squeeze bottle. The right ventricle contracts a little bit before the left ventricle does. <coughs> your ventricles then relax during diastole and are filled with blood coming from the upper chambers, the left and right atria. Then the cycle starts over again. Your heart is nourished by blood too. Blood vessels called coronary arteries extend over the surface of your heart and branch into smaller capillaries. Here you can see just the network of blood vessels that feed your heart with oxygen-rich blood. Your heart also has electrical wiring which keeps it beating. Electrical impulses begin high in the right atrium and travel through specialized pathways to the ventricles, delivering the signal to pump. The conduction system keeps your heart beating in a coordinated and normal rhythm, which in turn keeps blood circulating. The continuous exchange of oxygen-rich blood with oxygen-poor blood is what keeps you alive. Amazing, isn't it? So, okay, know a little bit more than you wanted to about how the heart works. Now, so we we look at, at what the heart now does every day. Now that you understand kind of how it works, this is what it does every day. Your heart pumps 7,200 liters per day, which is enough to fill up your car 180 times every single day. I mean, that's just that that's incredible. I was trying I was trying to explain this to my uh, my six year old and and telling him you know using the bathtub how many times he can fill up the bathtub. Uh, he, I'm glad he didn't have nightmares about that one. Um, 
so we look at at the you know how these arteries work okay when you have normal open arteries that are healthy vibrant alive you know no problems in these arteries you see how the the blood vessel wall is nice and smooth you know and you've got this nice tube coming through in order to deliver blood just like you know like a garden hose okay but what happens you hit it on the nose when you have inflammation in the arterial walls which we'll get into what causes the inflammation it starts to close down the center of that the, the, the center of the vessel now as a center closes here's the, the important thing to think about is if blood is coming from the heart off in this direction Okay, and your brain is up here because your brain during regular standstill, you know, like right now, your brain is consuming 85% of your body's oxygen. Okay, so, so your brain's sitting over here, and in this healthy artery, you can imagine how much blood is pumping through there. Okay, but what happens if you inflame the artery like this? What happens to the blood coming through there? It's constricted, so you can't get enough through. So what do you think a good, intelligent response to that would be? You know, knowing that... Increase uh, the pressure. Increase the pressure. Amazing, isn't it? So your brain sitting over here requiring 85% of that oxygen coming to the brain to keep it healthy, alive, vibrant, keeping your body supplied with oxygen so that you don't pr create disease... And now, without understanding the mechanism of this, we just go and we do a blood pressure medication. Okay? And what that blood pressure medication is, it forces the pressure to go down in these arteries. What does it do to the inflammation? Absolutely nothing. Okay? So until, you see, until we deal with the inflammation problem, really what we're doing is we're making a number go down on a sheet of paper. I mean, that, that's essentially the difference there. You know, and unfortunately that's enough. For most people that don't know any difference, that's enough. They just go ahead and take it. Wow, look, the blood pressure is coming down on the paper. But what is that really doing to our bodies? That's the big question. That's the big thing that we got to tackle. So, and then, of course, you get to the point where you have a totally occluded artery. How is a, uh, how is a blood pressure medication going to work there? Not too well. Yeah. You still end up having the stroke, heart attack, whatever it is. You know, we won't even cover an aneurysm. That's kind of a whole other story. So, MythBuster, high cholesterol causes heart disease. That's that's what we're told all the time. But we got to look at what actually is cholesterol, and this is this is what's really shocking. Okay, uh, it, cholesterol is a soft, waxy substance that is made by the liver. So, what does that mean? Is it natural or unnatural? It's natural, okay? Your body creates it, which if, if your body creates it, does that mean there's a purpose or no purpose? purpose. There's a purpose, okay? So 80% of it's made in the liver. It tra and, and a big point on that, too, guys, you don't increase your cholesterol by eating cholesterol. That is, a, that is another myth. You know, that if you eat, you know, people say, well, if you eat eggs, they're high in cholesterol, so that's going to make your cholesterol go up. That is not true. You, it's, it's a, go ahead. So, so what about people who reduce the amount of cholesterol they eat and they see their cholesterol numbers go down? Because typically it's a cholesterol-rich foods that actually, like, um, uh, say that again? Are inflammatory? Well, they're inflammatory, but they also, they're not healthy for you. Therefore, they make the body increase the cholesterol in order to deal with the, with the arterial damage. Yeah, so it's it's you know so it's I mean, one of the best ways I've seen it looked at is like if you go out on the street and you see you know and you see there is a car accident and you ask what you know what caused a car accident and somebody goes out and they look at the road and they see skid marks and say well look the skid marks cause a car accident that's kind of what we're looking at here you know is that yes they go hand in hand but one doesn't necessarily cause the other does that make sense okay so. It travels in the blood as two compounds, low-density lipoproteins and high-density lipoproteins. Okay, but, but I want you to see something here. Is there such a good thing as good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Yes. That's what they say. That's what they say. But you see what, what we just saw here. No, there's not. <clears throat> cholesterol is cholesterol. It just happens to be attached to a low-density lipoprotein or a high-density lipoprotein. What's the lipoprotein? Right, right, because of what it's attached to. But you see, the cholesterol is not bad. What's bad is how many lipoproteins of that kind you have in your body. And guess where those are created from? Diet. 
Okay, does that make sense? Lipoproteins, that's a great one for Wikipedia to, to, to get like the entire definition of that. It's, you know, basically it's, it's fatty protein chains. You know, so <clears throat> cholesterol is needed to manufacture hormones, bile acid, and vitamin D. Okay, and everybody in here knows about vitamin D, right? I think we've hammered enough on vitamin D. So is it important? Okay, and then you cannot make estrogen, testosterone, cortisone, and a host of other vital hormones without cholesterol. Okay, so, so do you still want the drug? Is it still a good idea to knock down the cholesterol? No, it's a natural product in the body. So what do we need to be addressing? Diet and the things. But, but see, the commercials say, well, when diet and exercise aren't enough, there's Vitorin, right? Yeah. You know, there, there's always these drug commercials that are, that are pointing out that these things aren't going to be enough, that you can't possibly diet and exercise and that's going to fix a problem. You always have to default to drugs. Right, that's kind of the idea that's going around out there. Okay, so moving forward. Okay, I thought it didn't change it. HDL is known as a good cholesterol because it helps clean the arteries. LDL is known as a bad cholesterol because it doesn't get carried easier or move around quicker. So do crows make garbage or does garbage attract crows? This is kind of looking at that thing. You know, we could go out again in the parking lot, kind of like the skid marks thing. You go out in the parking lot and you see all these crows around garbage and you think, oh my goodness, look at those crows. They're making the, making the parking lot a mess. They're correlated but that doesn't necessarily indicate cause, okay? But it sure makes money, right? I mean, cholesterol medications are the number one, uh, uh, Lipitor is the number one selling drug in this country. They're, they're, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but they're freaking out because their patent is about to expire in a year or something, and so they're trying to project, like, how much they can hold on to until the generic comes on the market and all this stuff. So, you know, it's market share, big thing. So Mythbuster, high cholesterol causes heart disease. The truth, it is the oxidation of cholesterol that causes heart disease. How does oxidation happen? Diet, toxins, it's all the bad stuff that we're putting into the body, but cholesterol in itself is not a bad thing. Truth, more people have heart attacks with normal cholesterol than with elevated cholesterol. Okay? There is a higher death rate with low cholesterol than high. So not only do they have more heart attacks, but they actually die more with the lower cholesterol. Uh, statin drugs, cholesterol drugs, lower cholesterol, but not the mortality of heart attack or stroke. Here's a big question. Then why are we taking it? I mean, if it doesn't lower the incidence of the very things. I mean, when you go to the doctor, who in here has said, um, you know, has, has been to a doctor and, and they've said, we need to get you on cholesterol medications because we really need to see that number lower on a piece of paper. Is that really the way that they put it? How do they get, where do they get their information? It changes every year. It changes constantly. They, you know, they, they'll have one study that says, you know, that, that says that it needs to be in a certain range, and then a couple of years later, they, they, they make the, the range even lower. And then they make the range lower. And then they make the range lower. Pretty soon, every 16-year-old in the country is going to be recommended to take cholesterol medications. It's going to be... High and low cholesterol affects your feelings very much. Um, uh, sure. I mean, if you if your cholesterol, if if you're unhealthy, meaning that your LDL cholesterol is is high on a piece of paper, then there there probably is going to be a correlation that you don't feel good because your body is unhealthy, but it's not because of the cholesterol per se. Now, on the other hand, being that your brain is composed highly of cholesterol, you might have some other issues there, too, if, you know, if, if you're uh, taking cholesterol medications. So, you know, it, it's just, again, you know, the, the reason why people take the cholesterol medications is typically because they're told that they're going to have a heart attack or stroke if they don't, right? I mean, it's not because they just want to see the number on the piece of paper go down so that you meet the range, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually based a little bit on fear there of take the medication or die. And there's usually not a whole lot of hesitation in saying that. But you guys, I mean, it's just, uh, all of this is New England Journal of Medicine. This isn't the chiropractic journal, <laughs> you know. I mean, this, this is their own journals that are saying this stuff. I've actually got uh, another one back here on the wall that says cholesterol medications do absolutely, they only appear to help men in the age of 65 and older that have had a previous myocardial infarction, but no women of any age whatsoever. So blanket, no women should be on it anyways. doesn't matter. Either way. 
Okay, so stands in the news why almost everything you hear about medicine is wrong. A major study concluded there's no evidence that statins, drugs like Lipitor and Crestor, help people with no history of heart disease. The study by the uh, Cochrane Collaboration, a global consortium, uh, was based on an evaluation of 14 individual trials with 30, 34,000 patients. That's, that's a good-sized chunk of people, right? Okay, cost of statins more than $20 billion per year, of which half may be unnecessary. Pfizer, which makes Lipitor, responds in part that managing cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, risk factors is complicated. That's it. Guys use that too, right? You know, it's complicated. <laughs> why, you know, why didn't you do this? It's, it's complicated, right? Don't try that one. So, uh, dangers of cholesterol medications. On the other hand, let's look at the flip side of it. You know, you see how how much need is, but look at the look at the side effects: liver damage, neuropathy, severe joint pain and ligament and tendon rupture, muscle wasting, atrophy, heart failure. Uh, cholesterol is a powerful antioxidant and protects us against aging and cancer. Okay, uh, depression stops the production of coenzyme Q10. Okay, all these different things are just ran, you know are just basic side effects of these medications. What do you mean protects us against aging. Protects you against aging. It's uh, again. You don't get older. Cholesterol. It makes up a high degree of the brain neurological tissue. How much does your brain have to do with aging? Everything. Everything. Because what controls and the the reproduction and regeneration of every single cell tissue organ in your entire body? Chiropractic principle. It's a brain and nerve system. You know. So you've got to have it there. Yep. Coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10. We're going to go through that. Yep. How do cholesterol drugs lower cholesterol? Statin drugs work by inhibiting a vital enzyme that manufactures cholesterol in the, in the liver. So in other words, it blocks a perfectly natural process of the body. Make sense? Okay. When you stop this enzyme, the liver can no longer make cholesterol. Right? Okay. Now, why does your cholesterol raise? Cholesterol is the body's repair substance. It's like spackle. It's what you, you know, if you go and you take a hammer and you chisel out the wall, you're going to have to go back and repair that wall, right? That's what cholesterol is in the body. Whenever inflammation occurs in the body, especially in the arteries, the liver has to produce more cholesterol in response to repair damage in the body as well as the arteries. So it's an intelligent response by the body. Imagine that. Okay? There's always a reason. There's always a, all the time I get questions from people by email and you know and all over the place, you know, like what can my friend take for this? You know, my my friend has hormone problems. What can she take? You know, and uh, I mean my my answer is always the same. They're like, "Okay, you're not going to give me a straight answer." You understand, I can't because whatever is happening in the body is always in response, intelligent response to something that's going on in your lifestyle. It always is. It's, you know, and, and we're learning more and more about that all the time. You know, that all the research is just validating it over and over. Of course, it makes sense, right? I mean, it's just basic sense. So your brain and nerve tissue is actually made of cholesterol. Imagine that. Okay? Your brain and nerve tissue is 60% cholesterol. How low do you want your cholesterol to go now? Right? You see, that kind of, you know, if you're on cholesterol medications, kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do here. You know, we're kind of uh, going against the principle at the same time. If you lower cholesterol with drugs, the brain and nerve tissue begin to deteriorate. When you deplete cholesterol from the brain, you block serotonin uptake to sites, which, incre- which decreases serotonin and causes depression. What's the number one class of medications now sold in the country? Which I'm sure Pfizer makes one of those, right? <laughs> So imagine that, you know, you, your number one selling drug now uh, has a side effect of, you know, X, depression, but we got a drug for that, right? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what we call side business. Right. Yes. One more question. Sure. Let's sure. say you got a person that's in good health or some question that's on a low Then you got a person that's in bad health or some question. Mm-hmm. Both of them just come off of it. Um, well, again, that I, again. Here's one of my off the wall answers. What defines good health? Well, I don't know. Right there, there's the problem. You know, is if you were if if that person was in good health, why would they ever be to the doctor to get on those medications in the first place? You know what I mean? But see, the way that we've been trained to see good health is, well, they go to the doctor for their checkup and they see that their cholesterol is high, 
but they feel good, right? You know, so you got person A that's healthy, feels good. Person B doesn't feel good, you know, and is an active breakdown, shutdown disease, you know, so they're unhealthy. But really, they're the same thing. Bingo. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, so the ones that look and feel healthy are, you know, apparently healthy. But the question still comes back to why are they sitting in the cardiologist's office then? Because there's underlying signs. There, there's, there's these underlying things that we're just not paying attention to. And until those are uncovered and dealt with, that eventually you take that person, they will end up in that seat every time. It's just a matter of time. It's always time. Time is a big difference. Time is the only difference between, between a simple problem and cancer. Really, I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's, we see that more and more all the time. And as we increase toxicity in all this, we're seeing that time frame shrink. You know, because things that used to be adult onset diseases are now child onset diseases. It's the, the gap is shrinking all the time. Time is getting less and less. <clears throat> okay. Coenzyme Q10 is inhibited when taking statin drugs. Coenzyme Q10 is a, a biochemical needed to transfer energy from food to our cells to be used for the work of staying alive and healthy. Fairly important, right? So it's an antioxidant which helps to reduce inflammation and protects you from cancer and aging. So, of course, this little negative piece of you know, research comes out. So now what's the standard protocol? Well, keep taking your cholesterol medications, and we'll just supplement you with coenzyme Q10. That works, right? You know, so so it's just every time there's a problem come up, let's patch something else over it. You know, the problem came up with, well, hang on, cholesterol is just cholesterol. What's that deal? Why, you know, why can't you explain this? So they end up coming up with the HDL-LDL separation. You know, so now you got drugs on the market that supposedly raise your HDL and lower your LDL all at the same time. It's it's just it's nuts. It's a house of cards. You know, that that's what I want you guys to see. It's it's just we got all this stuff piling on top of each other. It's a mess. It's gonna crumble at some point. CoQ10 is a primary building block for the cells of your brain and nervous system. If you are or have been taking a statin medication, it's essential to be supplementing with coenzyme Q10. If you insist on if you insist on staying on the medication after all this, you know, then then yes, you have to take it because if you don't, you're depleting. I mean, it's it's gone in your body. But I mean, I I hope everybody is questioning the whole process of taking it in the first place. That's really the question. I mean, I, again. The one thing, if more people die with, with low cholesterol than with high cholesterol, then doesn't that mean I actually want high cholesterol? You know? I mean, it's like, give me the, sign me up. You know, it's go ahead and let, but, but ultimately that's also not true. You, you know, if your cholesterol is high, again, there's reasons why. I want to I take care of the reasons why it's high. I want to get it back to low naturally, not just patch it over. You know, that's, that's kind of the name of the game. So cholesterol drugs increase heart attacks. Researchers followed 114 patients with heart problems who began taking cholesterol-lowering drugs. They found that every point of decrease of the serum cholesterol, there was a 36% increase in risk of death. Amazing. Should I lower my cholesterol? Every symptom in the body, in the body is doing the right thing at the right time. Has that not been the theme so far? You know, just pointing that out. Importantly, while many cardiologists insist that lowering cholesterol is correlated with a reduction in the risk of heart attacks, few can say that there is a reduction in the risk of mortality, hmm. which is death. That's what ultimately we're worried about, right? You know, it's, am I going to die if I don't take these medications? So, uh, in other words, it has never been conclusively shown that lowering cholesterol actually saves lives, which is the entire goal, right? That's supposed to be the goal. Uh, in fact, several large studies have shown that lowering cholesterol into the range currently recommended is correlated with an increased risk of death, especially of cancer. That's a medical doctor saying this. You know, so we're, we're just, you know, this, this whole thing is just all in debate right now, but the debate is coming apart. High blood pressure. Let, let's move on to that one. Increased blood pressure is an indicator that, is a, that there is a thickening or blocking of the arteries. What caused that? Inflammation, very good. Thickening of the blood is caused by platelets in the blood clumping together to heal the arteries, because of cholesterol, of course. Blocking of the arteries occurs from the blood being thick and from the placking in the arteries. Okay? 
what is a stroke? Two types of strokes. Ischemic, more common, it's when blood flow to the brain is blocked in an artery. The blocking happens from when a piece of plaque breaks loose in the artery. Now, usually, why are, why are they usually in the brain again? That, that's kind of important to touch on because you have a lot more density, you have a higher density of cl- capillaries in the brain than pretty much anywhere else, number one. Number two, the blood basically goes through your brain before it goes out to most other places. You know, so the, the pressure essentially is higher in your brain because, because it's going straight up to your brain before it starts going everywhere else. Uh, hemorrhagic, 85% again. Hemorrhagic, more deadly, occurs when weakened artery tears or ruptures. So that's when it literally rips apart. Okay. All right, cause of heart disease, inflammation. When you damage anything in the body, it starts an inflammatory process to heal that area. Think about the situation. Your kid gets bit by a spider, right? Okay, now, do you want to see a massive, swollen, red, irritated welt on that side, or do you want to see nothing at all? Bingo, yes, yes, yes. Because what is the welt? It's inflammation. It's the body's natural response. What it does is it pus basically is is squeezing out to get rid of and expel the toxins. Make sense? Mm-hmm. See, a totally different way of thinking, you know. But you want to see that stuff. You know, it's like a fever. You know, we, we we've been trained not to want to see a fever. You know, anything to crush that fever and make it go down. But the fever is telling you that something is right in the body every time. The body is actually fighting the infection. Okay, so when damage occurs to the lining of the arteries, chemicals are released to initiate the process of inflammation. Intelligent process. Arteries constrict, blood becomes more prone to clot. Intelligent process. White blood cells are called in the area to gobble up the damaged debris and cells adjacent to those damaged are told to multiply. Okay, so, so you destroy cells and recreate new cells to fill in that gap. Intelligent process. Ultimately, scars form. However, inside our, our arteries, we call it plaque. And the constriction of our arteries and the thickening of our blood further predisposes us to high blood pressure and heart attacks. You guys see how all that works? Don't worry if you don't, you'll get the notes. Right. <laughs> Review through it three more times. Okay, so, you know, I mean, it's all over in the news all the time. This one actually shows you, though, the surprising link between inflammation and heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and all these other diseases. You know, so mainstream medicine is starting to get onto this idea of inflammation being the root cause of disease. And you see it all over the place. I mean, you see it in pretty much all the major diseases, inflammation is right at the root. So, what was the date? Um, February, I think that's a 2004. Six years. Six years ago. So, what caused inflammation? Number one, sugar. Okay, that's, that's a big one. Who in here eats sugar? Okay. <laughs> Pretty much all of us, yeah. Number two, ratio of essential fatty acids. Should be four to one. What's the average American? 20 to 30 to one. Somewhere in that range. Way off balance. Acidity. And number four, free radicals. These are the four things that, that generally speaking, cause the most inflammation. Okay, so let's talk about these things. Sugars, grains, refined carbohydrates. Sugar causes increase in blood sugar. Grains and refined carbohydrates turn into sugar in the body within seconds. Everybody knew that, right? Okay, so immediately, as soon as you eat refined grains, they turn right into sugar. It's a quick, easy process. So the donuts, you know, they're right into sugar. Why, why can't diabetics eat donuts? Because they turn right into sugar. Yeah. Okay. What does your body use to decrease blood sugar? Cortisol and insulin. Okay. Of course, you guys are familiar with insulin. What is cortisol? That's the stress hormone in the body. Okay, that, generally speaking, that's what we know of as a stress hormone. Okay, so cortisol and insulin increases enzyme PLA2, which increases inflammation, which causes 90% of all diseases, especially heart disease. Okay? Inflammation causes damage to the cell wall of arteries, leading to placking. You see how this process is starting to unfold. Essential fatty acids. Research shows that omega-3 fatty acids found in fish oils stops the buildup of the plaque. Okay, it redu- which effe- essentially, at the end of the day, it reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke. Okay, fish oil also helps reduce inflammation, which which uh, it, it, that helps to clean the arteries. Fish oils are very good for joint problems, right? A lot of people know them for joint problems. Why? 
Because what are joint problems? Inflammation. Yeah, so you start taking high doses of fish oils and all of a sudden your knees start feeling better. Right? So if you have these kind of aches and inflammation and, you know, just random, you know, pain in all these different areas and stuff, usually it comes down to these balances in the body that are, that, you know, they're, they're trying to tell you something. So fish oil is good for you. Fish oil is very, oh yeah, very good for you, but in the right ratio. We're going we're gonna to cover that. The ratio of essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids, omega-3 and 6. Okay, these are the big ones that most people are deficient in. The ratio has to be 4 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. Okay. Now, you go to the health food stores, and usually what do you pick up? Everybody's looking for bottles of omega-3. You know, so now, you're, you need to add both of these, but if you just take high doses of omega-3, what happens? Yeah, now you go from omega-6, 30 to 1, and you start taking mass amounts of omega-3s, and the scale shifts. Now you're omega-6 deficient. But if you take it in the right ratio, it's going to balance out slower. But once you get to that balance, guess what? It stays there. Does that make sense? And you can keep it there on, from that point forward. What does that oil do to get the inflammation down? What does that fish oil do to, to smooth, smooth it out? Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> that that that's biochemistry. Okay. So that's definitely a bad question. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the actual mechanisms and everything. I mean, that's it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's. I mean, there's. Oh my goodness. That, that's one I'd have to even study up for about an hour to give you a thorough and complete uh, explanation of. But there, I mean, there, there's lots of, I mean, even if you get on, uh, if you just do a quick web search, you'd be able to find something fairly quickly, as long as you get it from a reputable source. When your ratio becomes imbalanced with, omega, with more omega-6, it leads to inflammation in the arteries leading to placking. Okay? The average ratio of North Americans is 50 to 1. That's, that's high. You know, usually I've seen a 30 to 40 to 1. Uh, fish oil supplements are so effective because this ratio, uh, you know, when you get these ratio right, you know, when you start to balance that out, all of a sudden you see all these inflammation processes go down, you know. And, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, with a lot of this stuff, the, the reality is we, you know, we, we, we try to think that we're so smart in understanding how all this stuff works. The reality is we don't. We don't understand how all this stuff works. We just we just know kind of where things are supposed to be, and and that thank God when we get them kind of in that direction, the body kind of takes care of itself, which is really the big principle, anyways. Let the body do its thing the way it's supposed to. So you know, in terms of looking at the ratio, I know ours is the right ratio. I don't know if you can. I mean, I've never seen another one that in, is in the right ratio. But how many of you guys are actually taking fish oils right now? Just so I kind of get the picture. Okay, so is it's about half. Three is that? Is three? Which one is, what is fish oil? Omega three. What's omega? Um, well, they have both in them. Okay. Fish oil has both omega three and omega six. But with this one, they take uh, it's a combination of fish, krill, flax, and uh, and barrage oils all to get it into the right ratio because each one has a different ratio. You know, so um, you know another way of looking at this and and just going beyond the heart that I want you to see is that the cell membrane of every cell in your entire body is composed of fatty acids in, that are supposed to be in this 4 to 1 ratio. And in, uh, in uh, Bruce Lipton, he's a PhD, that, that, uh, he's mainly the, the big guy behind uh, the understanding of um, epigenetics and how all that works. He's shown that, that essentially, you know, we all learned in science class that the nucleus of the cell was the brain of the cell. But that's not true. The nucleus is responsible for reproduction of the cell. So in other words, it's the gonads. Okay? But the central nerve system of the cell is actually the cell membrane because that's what does all the communication, both intracellular and extracellular. Okay? So think about that. Your, your cell membranes are the brain and nerve system of the individual cell. So how important is that? Very important. So fish oils are just critical in, uh, you know, and I shouldn't say fish oils, I should say omega fatty acids are critical in that balance. Okay, uh, healthy fat versus damaged fat. Um, the, the healthy fats that you can use olive oil, but you can't cook with it. Okay, don't cook with olive oil unless it's at low heat. Fish oil, coconut milk and oil, nuts, um, uh, cashews, almonds, saturated fat found in organic grass-fed meats. Yes. Uh, cashews, are they sure on cashews? Um, well, as far as the fats, yes. But yeah, there's other issues. Yeah, yeah. 
there's other issues. But the oils, if you can actually get just the oils out of them, you know, they're, they're better than most. What about having a bag of dimes? I know they it is in balance. I know that in that that it does have some of my. I, I'm I'm fairly sure. Hang on. No, this one actually doesn't have omega nines. Your your body does use omega nines, obviously, but I don't think it says. I don't. I, again, that's that's something that I have to look up, but I don't think the omega nines are as intricately involved in the actual cell membranes. Yeah, well, I mean, peanuts are a lot higher in omega six. Like if you get a, if you get a jar of peanut butter that has the oil on the top, what you want to do is dump that off and replace it with like coconut or olive oil and mix it all in because it's just it's really high in the omega six concentration. But I'd, I'd have to look into that, Mike, with, with uh, you know, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that it doesn't have as much to do with the cell membrane, which is kind of the big difference, you know. It's kind of like the difference between any other vitamin. Those oils over there are the proper, proper um, those, those are No, these are, the, these are the healthy fats that you want to stick to, right, and the, and they're, but they're not in the right ratio, no. They're still not in the right ratio. Right. We're talking about what causes inflammation here. Like the the these actually these damaged fats cause inflammation in the body. Yeah. So you know you want to stay away from the trans fats, canola oils, vegetable oils, all the commercialized meats which eat nothing but corn and get all these medications and all that kind of stuff. You know so you you know making sure that you're eating on the healthy fat side and not the unhealthy fat side that's going to obviously cut down on your inflammation so you don't have these issues leading into these other problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. What do you call in low heat? Low heat, basically low, like on on the lowest setting on your like stove. If no, that would be too high. Yeah, if you if you yeah, here's the here's a rule of thumb. If it's steaming, if it's smoking, then it's too high. It's already turning into trans fats. Yeah, like if you turn on your skillet and you see any smoke of, of the olive oil, it's already converting into trans fats. So coconut oil, uh, coconut oil, on the other hand, you can cook at that up to 450 degrees, and that's fine, and you're not going to have any issues there. I was just spraying some vegetables with uh, the olive oil and putting them under the broiler around 350, but that's still too high. Do this. Broil them first, and then spray the olive oil on them after you take them out of the oven. That way you still get the taste, but you don't oh, destroy the oils. Okay. Yeah. I don't think bread fits the category. <laughs> okay. So proper pH. All disease, including heart disease, has an acidic environment. Okay. Balanced alkaline and acid relationship is the key to true health. The pH scale is one to fourteen. The middle seven point three is neutral. That's uh, that's kind of where you want to hang out. Your pH has to be neutral in order to in in order slightly alkaline to never get cancer or any other disease process. So every time that they do studies and they look at pH in the body, basically cancer can't survive in an alkaline environment. So you want to keep your body in that slightly alkaline environment. Yet you look at most people and they're highly acidic because everything that we do. And we have in the uh, in I think it's in the Maximum Living Food Guidebook. There's a uh, isn't there the the um, the acid and alkaline food charts in there? Yeah, it's in our patient manual. There you go. So drbucknell.info, you can get on and download that. And it's, it's in there. But it shows you most everything that most people eat is on the acid side. All medications are on the acid side. You know, so it's fruits and vegetables, basically, that are on the alkaline side. So you can start to see why most people are acidic. Uh, lower than 7.3 is acidic and higher than 7.3 is alkaline. Now, I want to I talk about this just real briefly here. Because you ask some doctors about, you know, acid alkaline in the body, and they're like, oh, that's ridiculous. Your blood is going to stay within a certain pH because yada, 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 you know, because it has to. That's true. But the question comes down to how does it stay alkaline? How does it stay acid? It actually does it by removing and, and adding calcium from your bones. You know, so if your body is acidic, you, you, you know, you drink a soda, that makes you acidic, then your body immediately starts to pull calcium from your bones, in order to balance out the pH. You see how that works? Now it's still only going to raise, it's only going to pull enough calcium to pull you to that minimum range. Minimum range. So you still stay slightly acidic, 
Yet at the same time, now you develop heart disease, or not heart disease, uh, osteoporosis, because you're pulling calcium from the bones. But don't worry, they got a drug for that one too, right? Okay. Uh, to alkaline, you add you add calcium to the bones. Yeah, <laughs> but that that's really hard to do. That's. But once I mean, my it, sister, if we got one of these machines and she put alkaline, alkaline water systems. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I think. She may have had it too high or something, but her blood vessels all started breaking in her legs and things like that. Yeah. So she had to cut it way back. Yeah, you don't want to set those real high. You, um, I mean, the alkaline water systems are good, but I wouldn't set them over like 8, 8.5 at the most. Some people do it like, you know, yeah. up in the high, like 10, 11, 12 range. No way. That's, that's way too high. Okay, so each number away from 7, either way, is equivalent to 10 times. So you can see how that would be detrimental to your body. pH of, of 8 is 10 times more alkaline than 7, and a pH of 5 is 100 times more acidic. So you guys get the range there? I mean, we're talking miles here. It's a big, big difference in the body. A can of soda has a pH of 2.5. It is 50,000 times more acidic than neutral. It takes 30 cups of water to neutralize one can of soda. Okay. When pH is balanced, 7.3, the cells are able to absorb the right amount of oxygen, water, electrical impulses, and nutrients to replicate normally and never build disease. Unless you balance pH, you will never heal from any disease. You see why. Okay. When the pH in the body is lower, the body will do everything it can to raise pH, which we just talked about. Your body will take alkaline substances, calcium from the bones, from other areas of your body to normalize the pH. So, anybody want to go get a soda when we're done? Right? <laughs> okay. The body will take calcium from the bones to balance pH, causing osteoporosis. When the body becomes acidic, your arterial walls become damaged, creating inflammation. What is now happening to deal with that inflammation? Cholesterol, all good. Okay. Uh, where the where this acidic residues wind up will determine what name to put on the symptom. Pancreas, diabetes, heart, heart disease colon, Crohn's, or colitis. So it's all the same problem. It just depends on where we diagnose it. Right? Okay, so again, the body is one unit. If one thing is breaking down, what is the rest of it doing? Breaking down. Yeah. If you have a bet, you know, heart problems, the rest of your body is breaking down too. It's your one unit. Yeah. Any, has anybody ever heard of somebody where, where their, their kidneys died six years ago, but they're still healthy? <laughs> yeah, not generally. I mean, it's it's when 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 you are officially called dead, you know, pretty much everything goes at the same time. That's because we're one unit. That's that's a whole idea of of um, holistic. You know, the the holistic idea of of healthcare is you're all one unit. Sources that create acidity: meats, conventionally bought red meat, chicken, turkey, all deli or packaged meat. Does everybody know that we order grass-fed beef here? Okay, if you don't know that, we, we have an order sheet up there. Every month we order grass-fed beef, you just pick it up here. It's like, what, five? How much is it? Five fifty a pound? Okay. Um, sugar, refined carbohydrates. Sugar is acidic and destroys the immune system. Grains turn to sugar in the body right away. Dairy, caffeine, salt, alcohol, tobacco, artificial sweeteners, all medications, all these things are acidic. But there's that food chart that shows you all that stuff together. Okay, so the alkaline diet, standard North American diet, is highly acidic. Maximized living core diet pretty much swings totally towards this alkaline side. So all that is in the book. If you guys haven't gotten that or you want to check that out, you know, definitely, definitely pick up that book. It's good. Um, what causes free radicals? Free radicals cause oxidation of cholesterol, leading to placking in the arteries. Free radicals are created by sugar, acidity, toxicity. Was it, you know so so think about just your breakfast this morning or your lunch or, or even your dinner. Was it acid or alkaline based on what we've covered so far? You know, and how was it yesterday and the day before? So the last time to get it. How acidic is coffee? Coffee um, depends on how dark you brew it. <laughs> um, it's 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 still acidic, yeah, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there, you're, you're going to have your different... That's a, that's a great question. Here, here's, what you, here's what you do. Yeah, here, here's what you do. You, you know, you, you, if you're going to drink your coffee, number one, limit it. 
You know, like I uh, listen. I love coffee, I, and I I have you know a cup probably at least every other day. But when patients tell me that they drink a pot of coffee a day, I'm like, no, way too much, because I know there is no way that they're drinking ten pots of water to deal with that one cup. Now I can knock down ten cups of water in a day to deal with that acidity and break it down. You know, but there's no way you're doing thirty pots, or ten pots, or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Um, except if you're talking about coffee, because if it's if it's natural caffeine, it's really not bad for you. In fact, caffeine they're showing like like a real regular coffee bean, like not not I'm I'm talking not Starbucks coffee. Starbucks they harvest their coffee to have the highest caffeine content possible. But like organic coffee, yeah, it's not going to have that high of a rate of, of caffeine in it. But caffeine has actually been shown in research recently to prevent skin cancer. You know, so it's now if you're getting all crazy headed because of the caffeine, then you're probably taking in too much. But I mean, like I can have a, co- a cup of coffee before bed and it doesn't do anything to me. You know, if it's if it's the organic stuff. Now I drink Starbucks, I'll be wired for four hours you know so it's just that's a that's a huge when you're talking coffee there we're, we're talking like a massive range I mean there's you, you can do a slow for breakfast no is that what you have to put a, 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 a friend that has Vanilla ice cream and uh, a Coke. Oh, my goodness. And she's probably diabetic, too. I just want to say that lighter roast is more acidic than darker roast is less acidic. That is a great addition to a No. Okay. Lighter roast is less acidic, is more acidic. Lighter roast is more acidic. The darker the roast, the less acidic it is. Nice. Uh, that that is no. He used to run a coffee shop. Okay. Four years. Yeah. So that was that was incredibly valuable information. So, uh, so what? French roast. We want to go for the French roast organic. We have a Robica and we have a Rooster. Rooster is growing below two thousand feet, and a Robica is growing above five thousand feet. Most of us non-coffee connoisseurs know that as Arabica, right? <laughs> I'm like, Arab what? Drinking coffee black is better for you. Um, I'm thinking we're going to have to have like a whole seminar just on coffee because <laughs> look at that we're already over time <laughs> yeah it's whoa you know what um, Mike I'm going to get together with you and we're going to do an hour long audio on just coffee does that sound good okay Let, let's do that Seriously, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll do like interview style. And, okay. So what should you be doing for daily detoxification? Um, decreasing inflammation can only happen at a cellular level. Okay, you have to deal with it at a cellular level. Every cell is made of a lipid bilayer, which is what we were talking about. Okay, uh, that's two layers of fat, fatty acids, the omega six and the omega threes. In order to clean and detoxify a cell, the cell has to be opened up first. The only way to open the cell is with fat. Imagine that. Don't you love low-fat diets? Okay, that means healthy fats, though. The organic and free-range meats, things that could have been eaten 200 years ago. Detoxification support, you know, this is once, you, once you're getting those good fats in your diet, and so, so listen to that, we encourage you to eat good fats, high quantities of good fats. They're not bad for you. They actually help your body to burn fat. But then once you have those high fats in your diet, you add those good fats in the diet, now you add in the antioxidants and stuff in there to to drive into the cell to now release the toxins. And then once you have the toxins out, now you have to bind them up, which is the, the body detox part, so that actually binds the toxins and pulls them. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh... Three-step process. Number one, reduce sugar intake. Okay, replace stevia or xylitol in your coffee. <laughs> okay, instead of sugar. Number two, damage fats to healthy fats. So that means buy grass-fed meats. Uh, start doing coconut oil to cook with. You know, making these basic switches. Um, real butter instead of margarine. 
Okay, real butter has arachidonic acid in it, which is good for your eyes. Has a lot of different benefits. Change, huh? Real butter? Yeah, just not a lot of it. Yes, yes, definitely. Margarine is absolutely horrible for you. Absolutely horrible. Um, you change, it, yeah, like when you go to the uh, Japanese steakhouse. That, that's what I love when we did the dinner at the Japanese steakhouse. And here we're taking patients out to dinner, and then the guy takes his song, and boom, <laughs> big old slab of margarine on the thing. It's like, that's great. <laughs> okay, huh? How about fried candy bar? Fried candy bar. Fried Coke. That's a good one. We had a tennis last weekend. Yeah. Oh, man. Have you guys heard of that? Fried Coke. They take the Coke syrup and put it in the deep fat fryers. Oh, no. I yeah, was the, on the news the other night there. You can go to this uh, fair. Everything is fried. Uh, I mean, everything yeah. you can think of. Even the people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they just named everything. Green Snickers, fries. Mm. I mean, everything happens to this coat. Um, it crystallizes. No. Basically, you got a big old Coke funnel cake. <laughs> it's disgusting. I don't, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> With powdered sugar on top. <laughs> and what, what did... Uh, it, actually, that was Bill Maher. Yeah, and he said... Uh, Bill Maher was talking about that on his show, and he's like... And then they put a cherry on top because, of course, fruit is good for you. <laughs> okay, so change meat, change your meat, your eating to organic free-range poultry and grass-fed beef. That is going to have the right ratio. Ironically, grass-fed beef has the right ratio of fats because they're eating grass, which is in the right ratio. And then, and then tons of vegetables. You basically want to load your diet with vegetables. So you're not just eating mass amounts of grass-fed meat now. You eat small amounts of grass-fed meats. And lots of vegetables, okay? Big salads, stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> I say that again? You want actually as little cooked as possible. Like you want to eat them as raw as you can is best. Yeah, if, if you do cook them, definitely don't fry them. <laughs> Fried zucchini, I think I've seen that before. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, you, you want a raw beet? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do that. Um, but yeah, you want to lightly steam as much as you can if you can do it raw you know but even stuff like I mean like broccoli basically I mean broccoli isn't very good if you it is I mean it's, it's okay raw but I mean I'm not crazy about it but basically the second it turns no you can't <laughs> yeah so cook it as lightly as possible that's that's the big thing there Okay, the key to preventing heart disease, the brain-body connection, you know, summing all this stuff up. When you look at how the, you know, how the body heals, how, do the, how does the body heal? Brain-nerve system, okay? So it drives all these, pro- every metabolic process we're talking about still comes down to being coordinated by the brain because otherwise, how does the, br- how does the heart know how fast to be? You know, if you start running, how does the brain, how does the heart know to start beating faster? Because obviously the brain is sending signals, you know, and, and it uses hormones as, as physical messengers out to all the, all the organs and everything, too. So you look on the inside. Of course, a lot of you guys have seen this. You know, you've got the normal healthy spine. This is the normal healthy spinal cord. But when you lose that curve, that cord starts to thin out. It gets stretched out. What's that going to do to the signals going to the cells in order to tell them how to function and be able to maintain inflammation and all this other stuff we're talking about? Not good. You know, so you've got to keep the spinal cord, you've got to keep the wiring right. We look at degeneration now. You see phase two degeneration, how, you know, how the disc bases, everything's starting to collapse in on that cord. Cord begins to deteriorate. But this is a phase three degeneration. You know, and yes, we see patients that are still alive and walking around like this. But again, it comes down to, now, can you look like this and feel good? Definitely. I mean, this one here, can you feel good? Well, yeah. That one. Yeah. <laughs> and th- yeah. This one, eh, you're probably not going to feel too good. But guess what? We still see it. We still see it. And and you know, is it really that they feel good? I don't know. Probably some of it is they're just so used to feeling like junk that that's what they're used to. You know, I, I know some of us might be able to understand that. You know, it's just once you get used to feeling a certain way for a long time, that's just hey, that's normal. That's just the way it is. That photo reminds me of a little shop of horrors with Steve Martin where he's like, pulls up his dog teeth or whatever. 
Yeah, it's like, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nasty. You know, so bottom line with that, you know, you don't want to let this get here because you can, you know, when you, when you let the spine get like this, now does it, does it matter that your diet is now 100% clean and you're eating grass-fed meats? Does it matter that you're taking omega fatty acids? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're saying afterwards. <laughs> we're we're going to talk some more. <laughs> okay, so seven steps to reduce blood pressure. Number one, follow the maximized living diet. That's the advanced diet in the book. Number two, Hawthorne is a good herb to start dealing with uh, blood pressure naturally. Magnesium, CoQ10, garlic, fish oil, chiropractic. On the chiropractic note there, they, uh, the University of Chicago um, Hypertension Center did a, did a study like two years ago that showed that a chiropractic adjustment, they call it, I love it, they call it a special adjustment of the atlas, was more effective than not one, but two blood pressure medications used simultaneously. Why? Because, of course, it's affecting all physiology throughout the entire body. It, it makes everything more efficient. Besides chocolate, what do you get by medium? Oh, man. That, that's, a, that's, that's a question I can't answer right now. <laughs> uh, Hawthorne you can get from health food stores. You can get it in, I'm sure you can get it in teas, you know, stuff like um, that. They have it in standardized form. You know, standardized capsules that actually, you know, concentrate it. Yeah, yeah. I've taken some of that krill oil, and it sometimes gives me like a stomach ache. Krill? Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's going to be in like the uh, the balance ratio omega. But usually, if you're getting stomach aches and stuff like that, it's because of quality. Yeah. Uh, you know, anybody that's ordering, you know, getting your fish oils from like Walmart or something like that, just do a simple test. Go home and cut out the capsule and smell it. You know, and you'll smell the quality. Then you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, they'll eat it up. Okay, chiropractic cuts blood pressure. Well, we already talked about that. Okay, but this is actually what it does. Uh, it reduced systolic blood pressure by 14 points and diastolic pressure by eight points in just eight weeks. That's pretty impressive. Okay, there's not, there's, there's, I don't, I don't know of any uh, medications that have been able to do that. Seven steps to reduce cholesterol. Uh, polycosinol, which I don't even know what that is. Well, we'll look that up. <laughs> Red yeast rice, I know, I, you know, that one's used a lot, you know, and, and I've, I've heard a lot of good success with that one. Garlic. Red yeast rice, it's an extract. Yeah, you get it in a pill. It's a natural Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. Because you buy niacin and you can buy B6, B6 is very hard to find. Yeah, it, it probably just depends on who they're marketing to. <laughs> you know? How do you know how much it is to take? It depends on the person. Yeah, that's why we can't give numbers. I mean, it totally depends on the person. You, you might react to it totally. I mean, it's just like, you know, that's kind of like saying, well, how much Lipitor should I take? You know, a, a doctor's going to tell you, oh, well, we're just going to have to you test it. Huh? You say no. Well, right, I do say none. <laughs> uh, but the doctor's going to tell you, well, we're going to have to test you out, yeah, and move you up, move you down, you know, just kind of see what gets that number in range on paper because the paper's what matters, right? Okay. Fish oil, follow the maximized living nutrition plan, chiropractic, you know, all these things work. All right. What if you already have blocked arteries? Well, the good news is you have a completely new body every year. Your cells completely re- reproduce themselves. So that means you choose to create a body that is made of healthy cells and arteries through lifestyle changes. So you know, I mean, well, if you're clogged up, you can get it cleaned out within a year. Yeah. You just, you just getting all these uh, surgeries don't need to do it? No. No. In fact, uh, I've seen I've seen uh, uh, research that shows that you're more likely to die after bypass surgery than if you had not done it at all. But I mean, think about this. Think, think about the cancer patient who you know has terminal cancer, and they go to a completely raw organic diet, start exercising every day, you know, and do all this other stuff, and all of a sudden, ten years later, they're completely cancer free. How did that happen? Why is that cancer not still there? Because you're constantly reproducing the cells in your body. In other words, what you do right now matters. What you did yesterday matters, but what matters more? 
what you do tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, how many how many times do we tell patients that? Listen, it doesn't matter if you were getting adjusted for the last six months. If you stop today, where's it going? And we're constantly. It's it's like that's you know that that's that's the it's it's always moving forward. What's happening? You know, your most important day in that, in your health and life is today. It's what you do today. The rest of it doesn't matter. I could, I could go out and I could, you know, we, we could all go out drinking tonight. And guess what? Our health is going to be shot tomorrow based on our choice right now. That's not an invitation. <laughs> okay. If you had a hemorrhage in your heart that was stopped up, how long would it take to unstop them if you didn't have surgery? It de- it totally depends on what you do, the measures that you take. You know, so, so, and... But they're damaged. Yeah, yeah. The the way I want to answer that is is and and this is just comes from six years of dealing with patients. Here's the way people act. You know, here's the way that we generally act. What is the minimum that I have to do to do this? You know what I mean? Like like if 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 I have to uh, you know if I need to make this much money to pay my bills, what's the minimum number of hours I have to work in order to get that? You know, if we're married, guys, what's the minimum I have to do to keep my wife happy? Right? No, no, nobody. No. <laughs> Notice, notice nobody laughed on that one. <laughs> yeah, they're like, shut up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's, I, we see it all day long. That's the way that we, that's the way that we act. We do the minimum that we possibly have to in order to do it. But, but you see, that, that's kind of what we're trying to overcome with maximize living is is it's don't do the minimum do as much as you know to do now are you going to know to do everything no I don't know to do everything I don't know any doctor that does know everything to do but thank God that at least we I get to collaborate with 350 other guys that know some other stuff to do so that collectively we can know a lot to do make sense or is that too many to do's okay <laughs> so you know, do as much as you can. Do as much as you know to do. And when you don't know any more to do, ask. And when they don't know any more to do, ask for resources. And continuously learn all the time. You know, I can guarantee you Jacqueline was learning all the way until he died. I can guarantee you. Well, what about this 12-minute exercise? We're always trying to cut it down. Next, next it'll be 6-minute exercise. If we could make it 6-minute exercise, we would. Yeah, we're, we're working on that. But I mean that goes the whole, you know, cutting it down to the minimum. I mean Well, there there's a reason now there. I get what you're saying, but there's a reason now there because when you go over usually about fifteen to twenty minutes, now you start to see cortisol start to rise up. Well you start eating into all your your stored up glycogen and everything. Bingo. Else, but yeah. Isn't that good to flush it out every so often or? I'm 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 not opposed to that. Back in the farming days, they didn't go okay, fifteen minutes, man. We're definitely yeah, yeah. But they also weren't going out a hundred percent. Can you imagine somebody, you know, bailing hay at a hundred percent? You know, so it's the sustained stuff isn't that much of a problem. But but it's just you get it. It's really about doing it efficiently. At the same time, you don't want to go all out. Who in here wants to take thirty different supplements every day? Right? No, you want to do it as good as possible, but you also want to do it efficiently. You know, so like, I guess you could, you know, look at the bottle of Paleo Greens, you know, and say, well, organic and fresh would be better, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to open, I'm going to look and I'm going to take every single one of those fresh fruits and vegetables that's in the Paleo Greens, and I'm just going to make sure that I eat all of those every day. You know what I mean? But you see, that's not very efficient. So it's a balance. Yeah, it's it is. <laughs> you have your Power juice, sir. Good breakfast would be like uh, like what what you recommend for like having for breakfast. Um, I'll tell you one of the best things that that I do is the uh, the pally meal. That stuff is awesome with coconut milk. You have it every day. Pretty much, yeah. Except, I mean, I'll, I'll have eggs once in a while. Eggs are good. You know, we do uh, we do gluten free cereal, which is made from rice. But we don't do any like uh, you know any wheat cereal. Definitely no Cheerios or Lucky Charms. I'm about egg whites versus the yolks. I mean, I'm still back and forth on that one. I'm I'm totally fine with eating the yolks. I have no contention there. I mean, so 
Six, eight eggs a day. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about it, the, the yolk is where the baby chicken actually comes from, so apparently that's where the nutrients are. You know, and that's where the higher fat content is, which is why they tell you not to eat the yolks, because that's where the fat and the cholesterol is. But we just talked about all that. As long as it's good fats in there, it's actually helping your body. So, okay. Uh, arcs of life, increased thoracic arc, or loss of the... Um, who in here does not? Well, you know what? No, I'm 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 gonna buzz through this just because uh, it, it's it's that important. So, could that hump on your back be killing you? Hyperkyphosis means too much heart. This is this is the person that's walking around like this. We all know people like that. Okay, so hyperkyphotic posture predicts mortality in older community dwelling people. Older men and women with hyperkyphosis tend to die earlier. That's what they find in this research. So the more humped over you are, the, the, the higher the rate of death. One of the things that we know is correlated with that is that when you hunch over like this, it causes degeneration in the thoracic vertebra, which compresses on the nerves going out to the heart. Okay, so now you see a correlation with heart disease too. So all these things go hand in hand. Chiropractic and wellness patients, this study looked at 311 chiropractic patients aged 65 and older who had received maintenance care for five years or longer versus healthy citizens the same age. Now, maintenance care, that's probably, you know, like occasional care once a month or something like that. Who knows what it is? Um, But nonetheless, even at infrequent maintenance care, chiropractic patients spent only 34% of the national average for health care. They had 50% less medical provider visits. 98.5% considered the care to be considerably or extremely valuable. 60.2% fewer hospital admission. And 85% less pharmaceutical costs. So just curious of patients, uh, raise your hand if you've seen uh, cost of medical care go down since you started chiropractic. Medical care as in... Okay, so... Your personal home. A personal home. Some of, some of us might not have just had any before then, but pretty much just we see that as a consensus. You know, some of you are new, you know, so obviously you're not going to see that yet. But um, here, here's the bottom line, and I'll just, I'll just show that, uh, throw, throw myself on a limb here. If, you, if you've been a patient for a long time and you haven't seen a decrease in medical costs, that tells me that you're not all in. Okay. That, that's I know that's raw, <laughs> but but that's just that's just truth. Is that is that there's things that aren't being done. There's there's the dietary changes. There's exercise changes. There's things that aren't being done. But if you start doing those things, guess what will happen? I guarantee you, you will see a decrease in what you're having to do on the outside. Okay, uh, steps to preventing heart disease. Follow the Maximize Living Nutrition Plan. Garlic, CoQ10, fish oil, multi-mineral vitamin, antioxidants, daily detox, chiropractic. Guys, it's five essentials just all over the place. You see it's the same thing, just five essentials over and over and over again because they're all the same things. Now, if you really think you need to go and get testing, listen up. Getting your cholesterol checked doesn't really tell you anything. I, I hope we see that now. Getting your blood pressure checked doesn't tell you anything. These are the tests that actually tell you if there's something wrong. Okay? So C-reactive protein is a protein produced during inflammation. This test is a general marking, marking for inflammation. It does not tell you a specific disease. Okay? So you go and you get the C-reactive protein and it's through the roof. You know that you have systemic inflammation which you can just correlate to, well, that's why my blood pressure is high or that's why my cholesterol is high. Make sense? Okay. Often not ordered because there is not a conventional drug or treatment for this. Why not? Because can a drug eliminate inflammation? Drugs, for the most part, they increase inflammation, right? Because they're acidic. The overall picture, they haven't figured out how to make this, how to make this work. Harvard researchers have found that a high level of CRP increases risk of heart attack 4.4 times. That's significant. Research shows that C-reactive protein level is a stronger predictor of cardiovascular events than the LDL cholesterol level. So you think that test might be important? Okay, if we're going to look at something, let's look at this, not looking at cholesterol. Uh, second one, homocysteine. It accelerates the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, which creates plaquing in the arteries. So high levels of homocysteine is a sign of plaque building up in the arteries. 
Okay, another one that you might want to look at instead of just cholesterol by itself. And then, of course, nerve system check because uh, if if your you know cholesterol and blood pressure are fine, but you uh, but you snap your spinal cord, does it really matter that your numbers look good on paper? No. So we got to prioritize things. You know, it's just it's. We, we can't just throw, you know, we can't talk about all this heart disease stuff and everything else and not talk about priority in the body. You know, but when you start to apply all the five essentials together and you put them on the right ranking, all of a sudden your health starts changing and you start to see these numbers come under control. So um, if, if you're not a patient, I think there's just a couple of you that aren't patients, you know, obviously we'll gladly do a, a nerve assessment for you, do x-rays, whatever we need to do to get you checked out and see what's going on there. Um, but then... The next thing, you know, for everybody else, you know, that is a patient, you guys know about the community dinners, okay? We have a community dinner coming up on the 21st, okay? So do you think this information that we covered here tonight was or was it valuable to you? Okay. Do you think it might have been valuable for somebody that you know? Do you know some friends, you know, that probably would have liked to hear this kind of stuff, might save a few years of their life? Right? Pretty much all of us know somebody like that. So but they're never they're not gonna do that until they get exposed. You know, and so we do the dinners to get them exposed because a lot of these people, right, I know, you know, you talk to them. You know, you 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 guys have talked to people and, and they they don't listen. Right? You know, they, they think that they're okay because they don't know any difference. But until they get exposed, they won't know any difference. So do whatever you got to do, drag them kicking, screaming, whatever. Just get them to the dinner and tell them free food. That's why we do it because that works. People like food. You know, so get them to the dinner. We just, I'm, I'm going to ask if there's five of you in the room that know that you have somebody that you can bring to the dinner. Talk to April out front, okay, and, and, and get somebody down on the list, you know, so that we can uh, so that we can start to help them up. February huh? 21st, 730, or what is that? 20, it is the 21st, right? Did I say the date right? Yeah. What At 7. That? It's on a Monday, Monday night. Yeah, the dinner is generally speaking, we always do on Monday nights. President say good day. Oh, it's going to be at night. Yes. Okay, um, and that's that's it as far as that goes, uh, guys. Last thing, um, anybody that you know, we we went through a lot of products and stuff, and and I know some of you guys aren't taking fish oils yet, or you're not doing the daily detox yet, or any of this stuff. If if any of the products that I talked about tonight, which was what coconut oil. Uh, fish oils, anything that I talked about tonight that you guys want to take home with you tonight, we'll we'll do 20% off, okay? But that's only tonight. That that does, I mean, that's <laughs> we we can't carry that out like past tonight. We've got to keep that, you know, on the down low. So, uh, it, yes. Can I just ask a question because sure. we talked a lot about how people with low or normal cholesterol actually have a higher risk of heart attack or heart disease or dying of it mm-hmm. or et cetera, et cetera. So. I'm just curious about that because what does someone who has that do? Because I have low cholesterol. I have low blood pressure. If I lowered my blood pressure, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Now, now, okay. Here, here's, and that's a, that's such a good question, <laughs> because the reality is anybody that's generally speaking healthy. I mean, you you keep a fairly clean diet, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so my cholesterol ain't high either. You know, your cholesterol should be low. But here's the thing. When you when you were looking at population scales, when you're looking at studies, you're looking at population. So we take a, you know, if we went to uh, Winn-Dixie right now and we just grabbed everybody in Winn-Dixie, how many of those people in there do you think would be healthy taking a good diet? Not very many, right? So pretty much everybody in that population class is doing the standard American diet, or what we call the SAD diet, okay? So for the most part, you're not going to find anybody in there that is taking low cholesterol except for the people that is lower because they're taking statins. Okay. Does that make sense? So I'm just curious if it's just sort of your cholesterol range is just a genetic tendency, and that it really has nothing to do with lifestyle factors at all. You know, because I'm, I'm overweight. I eat a lot of sugar. My brother is like 300 pounds, and he has low cholesterol. And my dad, I don't know what his cholesterol was, but he died of a heart attack at 39. So, yeah. like, it's just, 
is there a genetic tendency? Absolutely. There's genetic tendencies in everything. I, I think the best thing, and I know you would, I know you would eat it up, just just knowing you. Get the book. Uh, get the book by Bruce Lipton. Um, uh, I, I, he's got like three of them. The biology of belief, I think, is the main one. Write that down. In fact, I'll give you the audio of it. I've, I've got the audio. Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it basically it goes through epigenetics and, and goes through how um, basically quantum physics is completely retraining the way that we think about biology. Because, of course, everybody knows your, your cells, like, you know, this really isn't real stuff. You know, it's, it, you're, it, quantum physics is a whole, I mean, it'll crack your skull open. I mean, it's, you are nothing, yeah, you are nothing, you are literally nothing but energy. Everything is energy. And it's the way that energy is organized that makes what we see as stuff. Okay, so it's, oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, just think about a single atom is, you know, protons and neutrons in the middle with these spinning electrons, but they're not really spinning electrons. It's actually an energy shell that we can only make sense of when we call it a particle. You know, so, anyways, that book would explain how genetics actually plays in. Basically, what he comes down to is it's about a 3 to 5%. So there are those 3 to 5% who eat sugar and still are going to have low cholesterol. But generally speaking, it's not the 3 to 5% that we deal with every day. It's the 95%. Well, I just see, like, in families, it's like, oh, yeah, we all have high cholesterol. Like, once people's families start talking or whatever, it's like, oh, we all have high or we all have low or we all have this. It's just, mm-hmm. is it just... That your body has on, the, on the same note, though, because, again, I, I deal with a lot of families. Generally speaking, we, we say, well, you know, your, your family's eating the same diet, too. Right. Your family exercises the same amounts. You know, we, we tend to be in a particular culture within our family, so we follow the same trends in that in itself. Right. But yet, it's funny how you can take somebody from Okinawa who has supposedly these good genetics, you move them to the United States, and it doesn't matter what their family is doing back there, they develop heart disease and cancer. Yet I take you and I transplant you over into Okinawa now, and all of a sudden those disease implications start going down. So a culture, I mean, it does have, it has a massive amount to do with it. Lifestyle is definitely the 95%, but yes, there is still the 3, three to 5% you've got to deal with. Hopefully we'll, we're just all in the good three to five percent range. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, guys, that's it. Um, yes. What is considered normal for blood pressure? Um, normal for blood pressure. Generally speaking, the, the 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 way that we understand it is between the age of you know up to the age of sixty, it's a hundred plus your age would be okay. You know, so if so if you're 160 at 60 years old, that's really not that bad. 100 plus your age. Yeah, that that's what that's what a lot of experts are saying. That's not that's not my numbers. I didn't make that up. That's that's what the general consensus is amongst amongst people that really are looking at the physiology. Like I said, it cuts off at 60. <laughs> Generally speaking, that that starts that's in the range where you're starting to get abnormal. You know, it's when you get up around 160. Yeah. So what what's yours? Mine's normally about 180. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a little high. So that's you're you're talking inflammation. You're definitely in the inflammation range. Good to have you, Joe. No, no. We're, we're, seriously, we're going to do that audio. Is that the uh, fish oil there? Yes, the perks ratio omega. Now, how, um, how many pills or how many do you take a day? Uh, there's 90 in here. It says three, three a day. Um, if you're taking right now, you're taking cholesterol or blood pressure, I would definitely take three a day, at least until you know that your numbers are in the clear. But if your numbers are in the clear, then you can just do two a day and that's fine. In fact, I only do one a day. So, you can check it out. 